Okay, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today and tell something about the work that we are doing. It's the first time I'm at this meeting, so I've enjoyed it very much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a biogeochemist, microbial ecologist, working in, on element cycling carbon and nitrogen cycling from all kinds of aquatic habitats, from rivers to coastal oceans to deep oceans to, and in recent years, in hadal trenches, which has got us in, uh, increasingly interested in, in the deepest part of the end of the ocean continuum in the past years. So Claire this morning made a similar presentation of the distribution of water depth on the planet making clear that a, deep part, a, a significant part of Earth is covered by deep sea ocean. I kept the slide in just to emphasize this part out here, which is literally unexplored, the water depth that goes from six kilometers and down to 11 kilometers, which covers about 3% of the ocean bed and which is about the size of Australia. And that's where I'm going to take you today. Claire also made a great introduction to why we're interested in looking into the sediments of the deep ocean and the oceans, uh, sediments in, the, in general, that basically on short time scale, they're an important source of CO2 and nutrients to ensure continued production in the water column, but on long time scales, they're an important sink that basically, and the efficiency by which this carbon is turned over versus retained is a very important feedback for the redox conditions of the global ocean. Another thing that Claire also touched upon and which I just want to re-emphasize is that the total oxygen uptake rate of the seafloor is a great proxy for the total turnover of carbon, even though you can have high anaerobic degradation because of reoxidation processes, oxygen in electron equivalent is a good proxy for the total turnover of carbon. I'm happy to discuss that later on, uh, uh, to what extent that assumption holds in, in all environments. Maybe Hadal Trenches is one of the places where it doesn't hold. The thing I also wanted to emphasize before getting on the move is that if you want to measure oxygen uptake rates as great depth, you have to measure in situ. You cannot just take a sediment core up at, and during change pressure and change temperatures and then quantify the metabolic activity on such a core and think you get what's happening on the seabed. There's one example here from some early work where measured in the laboratory versus in situ at 3,000 meters of water depth, and you clearly see in situ a much deeper oxygen penetration than you have in the laboratory. If you take the ratio of what you measure in the laboratory versus in situ and plot it versus water depth, you get a relation something like this. So it means when you get out to five kilometers of depth, you in the lab measures three, point three, or three to four times higher activity than there actually is. And the oxygen penetration depth is only about 20%. So if you want to measure correctly and if you want to measure process rates, it's strongly preferred to measure in situ. And what I've done here is I've compiled sort of the high quality data that's been measured by various people around the world. And this one strongest parameter, of course, that these data fits towards is water depth. So when we move deeper and deeper into the ocean, the benthic oxygen consumption declines because less and less material makes it down there. Claire also emphasized that you can measure oxygen uptake rates by two approaches, chamber incubation to AD covariance for that sake, or diffusive oxygen uptake rates. The open symbols here are the diffusive, and the closed symbols are the total. The difference is the contribution for fauna. And if we scale that area of that triangle to the bathometry of the global ocean, it means that fauna is responsible for about 20% of the global turnover or oxygen consumption in the seabed, or turnover of carbon, if we use oxygen as a proxy for the turnover of carbon. If we scale the equation here to the global bathometry, we get about 1.5 gigaton carbon turned over per year, corresponding to about 3.3% of the primary production estimated. Um, you can also look at which provinces of the ocean that are responsible for that turnover. And you have here the coastal ocean, which I defined here from 0 to 200 meters. It balances or it matches almost what's happening in the deep sea. So even though we go one or uh, maybe even two orders of magnitude down in activity when we move into the deep sea, because it's so vast, it's still a very, very important component in the total turnover of carbon and oxygen consumption, the um, coastal shelves being in between. So you see a lot of scatter in this plot, and that's, of course, because there's other variables than just the water depth that matters for, for the turnover of carbon. And I won't dwell much uh, on it, but one is, of course, the surface primary production. So if we make a 
simple relation where we sort of look into the total oxygen uptake rate versus primary oxygen water depth, we uh, can describe much better and get much better fit to this curve up here of the turnover of oxygen and carbon in the seabed. The integrated values globally and regionally become is the same, but now we can make maps of where things are happening uh, more intensively, and we can also, for instance, make maps of where fauna is important for the turnover of carbon or oxygen in the seabed. Another factor that causes all of these variations is because the seabed is not flat. It's a seascape where we have seamounts that's quite importantly can induce local hotspots of productivity dumping high quality carbon into deep ocean. And Claire also mentioned early work by, by Claire and by Rick Yankee that sort of demonstrated how lateral transport from the coastal ocean to the abyssal plains stimulated activity in the deep sea close to the continental margins. But one extreme case of this is the deep hadal trenches. There are about 27 hadal trenches. Um, they're covering, as I said, a size in the order of Australia. And they are characterized by an extreme hydrostatic pressure characterized by endemisms, organisms adapted to uh, these high pressures. And they have early on, when I say early on here, we're only talking about 20 years, been considered to be sites of uh, deposition of material. Very early studies too, just 15, 20 years ago, also indicated that maybe these activity, when you go really deep, starts increasing because we have an intensified deposition of material in these trenches. So maybe this pattern here is reverted when we go really deep, and the deep sites of the global ocean becomes hotspots for deposition and turnover of carbon. And to explore that, we developed uh, instrumentation that could go down to the deepest site on Earth, Mariana Trench in 2010, and later in Tonga Trench, which is the next deepest site, 10.11 uh, 11, 11 kilometers and 10.9 kilometers depth roughly at, at these two sites. And here are the data from the Mariana Trench, Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. The red data are measured in situ, and the black ones are measured at the abyssal plain, only 60 kilometers away from the uh, Challenger Deep. And you see here the stronger attenuation of oxygen, meaning there's a higher biological activity in the sediment, and you can sort of quantify it, or we have quantified it here, is roughly a factor of two. If we recover sediment cores from the deepest site and from the abyssal plain, and we take the ratio between the values we get there, we can see that they both appear enriched in the hadal trench in organic carbon and chlorophyll A, a proxy for phytotital material, much, much higher cell numbers, many more bacteria in the sediment in the Mariana Trench, and also higher led to 10, which is a proxy for the deposition of materials. You see that all of these values are about one. So indeed, when you go to the deeper side on Earth, you start having higher activity than you have in the abyssal plain. Same thing on the Tonga Trench up here, and that was even more extreme where you sort of have the in situ profiles here at 10.8 kilometers and the abyssal plain in situ profiles here, and much higher activity at the deep site. So deep sites, apparently, at least the two deep sites in the world, are, have intensified biological activity, intensified deposition, and intensified turnover of carbon. So what is driving that? And there are a number of processes, and I'll just discuss two here, that are important for this. One is seismic activity. These trenches form where you have uh, uh, subduction of the continental plates. And we were able to take advantage of a very terrible situation, was the big earthquake in 2011, where I think we all saw the tsunamis on, on the meteors uh, coming in along the Jap uh, Japanese coast and quickly get an expedition together and go out in the Japan trench and see what has happened. And what we saw was that we could take sediment slabs, uh, sediment cores up here, and these are just CT scans that sort of show that we have a different density layer that was deposited very suddenly or very quickly, about 25 centimeters, as you see here. You have a lead to 10 that's vertical, indicating that this material was settled very, very quickly and shortly, and down here, uh, or very fastly. And, um, that you here had the original uh, sediment surface where you have the modern exponential decline in the lead tube tank. We could also, from our tow camera, see there was lots of carcasses, lots of material that simply came down and was transported along the slopes and into the central axis. Of course, material that can sustain biological activity at great depth for a long time. 
What we also found was that if we just moved a little bit five kilometers away, we also had sediment deposition there, but much less. Uh, that shows something about the variability in the trenches. So even if you just go one place, that might not necessarily characterize the entire trench. But we also found cesium-134, which is a very short-lived isotope. And that could only come from one place, and that was the Fukushima nuclear power plant. So that means four months after the incident, we could find waste from this uh, incident on land, telling something about the connectivity of these great depth with the coastal ocean and also terrestrial carbon sources potential. It's just a recent paper that came out that has estimated that a staggering about one teragram organic carbon was deposited during this event in, in, the, um, in the trench. So that's one way of which carbon can make it uh, down to this depth. And because it's also enriched by a lot of dead animals and other stuff that comes and from the coastal ocean, it can sustain elevated bacteria for quite a while. That's at least our hypothesis. Another way that carbon can make it down deep is that you have a deposition of particular or marine snow, particular organic matter that sinks down to great depth. This is actually a photo we took out of, of the sub at 1,500 meters of water depth in the Sagami Trough, which leads into the Japan Trench. To try to investigate if pressure in any way has a role in to what extent labile stuff can make it down deep, we have established a, a pressure tank at, at SDU, and we work around with various communities, for instance, uh, phytotrichal aggregates, and keep them sinking at different pressures. And we can, with oxygen sensors inside, at the same time measure the oxygen consumption of these sinking particles. And this is work of uh, Peter Steve uh, from my group. Uh, where he measured the bacterial consumption, for instance, in such aggregate as a function of pressure. So the, here we have the activity of, in percent of one bar. Up here we have the about 100%. But you quickly see that the activity ceases when pressure is increased. So that means particles from the surface oceans that are exposed to higher pressure basically doesn't de get degraded. They sink there because pressure inhibits the communities that are colonizing the surface particles. At least not until specialists from the deep ocean start colonizing these particles and, and uh, take advantage of them. The same with bacterial growth. That's basically ceases of the surface community. So therefore, labile stuff can make it quite deep and also potentially into the Hadal trench systems. Yeah. So another effect that um, that these particles is the introduced variability of the seabed. And to try to see to what extent if we have measure very, very many time oxygen profiles in the seabed and look at the variability, to what extent is there an imprint, for instance, of deposition of uh, marine snow particles. And here we just had our microsensor that could move, a microsensor array that could move and measure many, many, many oxygen profiles. And then by the ROV, we could move it one meter, 10 meter, 100 meters, and sort of see what scale did it matter to move on on the seabed for what we recovered in oxygen uh, penetration depth. And here you can see these hundreds and hundreds of measurements, and the red line is the average. I think you can already now see there's a huge variations on the small scale. This is just a zoom in of, of that. You can also plot it differently. So the white here is the sediment surface, and the isopletes here is the oxygen distribution below the surface. Here's just four examples of the many, many profiles. If we know the oxygen distribution, we know something about the transport coefficient, we can calculate how, where oxygen is consumed in the oxygen zone, and we get a mosaic like this. So we get diagenetic hotspots, and we get areas where very little is happening. And that's a very, that was eye-opening to me at least, that that's the scale we have to think of when we try to relate processes and distribution of organisms. It's all the different processes. It doesn't help that if we measure over here for one process and then measure another process over here, we can't relate them because they, va they vary on a scale that's on the size of the marine snow particles. Actually, we could calculate from statistical measures that the characteristic pet size that you had to move to get a different result of the seabed was 2.1 centimeter, which fits pretty much to the distribution size of the marine snow particles of this size. And just to demonstrate that that you can see that here is what an, an illustration of that in the laboratory. What you have here is marine snow particles settle at the sediment. That's the black and white image. And we have developed a technique where, when, where you, by special chemistry, can take movies and pictures of oxygen distribution in such an image here. 
And you can sort of see an anoxic micronese after a lag phase evolves in that hotspot. You can see how myofauna is homing in on this, taking advantage of that hotspot of material that settled there, and after 170 hours, it's gone. So here you have a quick succession to the microbial community. Here you have the evolution of vi uh, uh, viral infections and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So you have a whole succession in this microscale community here. And I think that's important when we start interpreting our data, and looking at our data of process rates and microbial distributions. This work sort of seeded a, a, a big project that we were awarded to try to explore the three, three different trenches in the Pacific Ocean. The objectives were to develop a new generation of autonomous vehicles and to explore the biochemical and the biological functions of these deep trenches. And we wanted to focus on three trench systems, the Atacama Trench because it's underlying a very productive water column, Kermadec because it's an extremely oligotrophic area, and Japan Trench, which is mesotrophic. Um, we have now realized cruises, we're roughly halfway through the project, and we have now realized cruises to the Atacama Trench and Kermadec Trench within the last one and a half year. And I have to say that we are still working a lot of thousands and thousands of data. It involved um, uh, 45 scientists of various things. So we basically started a lot of different variables. It was geologists, pathologists, and biologists, hydrodynamics, geologists, to try to understand how these trenches function. So I'll just show a little bit of the data that we have worked with so far. And I'll stay with the oxygen landers and the oxygen profiles. Again here, this is the Kermadec Trench. This is the deep trench here where we had six stations. Here's the reference station, seven. You can sort of see a very deep oxygen penetration below 20 centimeters. But when we move in on the trench axis, again, you have much shallower oxygen penetration, much higher bi biological activity along this trench axis here. But what's interesting is that we have a very different variability on here. So each of these different sites are quite different in the activity, the turnover of carbon or the oxygen consumption, but all of them elevated compared to the uh, uh, abyssal site. Similar, when we go to the Atacama Trench, uh, where we have the South American continent here. These are the reference sites on the continental side, on the, um, the ocean side. You can see oxygen penetration, they've done about 22 centimeters here and about seven centimeters here. When we move into the trench, we only have oxygen penetration in the order of four to two, three centimeters there. So highly elevated diagenetic activity in the trench system here compared to what we have on the abyssal plains around it. So indeed, these are very intensive hotspots for turnover of carbon, for deposition of carbon and turnover. Of if I plot here the activity there, that's not, it's just in the order of activity. The red ones are the hadal site and the green one are the abyssal site. You can see the variability and the elevated rate in these two trench systems. It also reflects that we have low activity in the Kermadec trench because we have a lower productive water column than we have in the Atacama trench. The question is now, of course, what is driving this difference along this trench axis? To what extent does it re reflect last time we had a mass vasting event redepositing material to the trench axis? To what extent does it reflect that we actually have internal waves or internal secking within the trenches that we know or focus material deposition along the trench axis? That's some of the questions that we're working on now. If we take the data, and that's all the HADL data that exists here, uh, the black one that was uh, available before, I've put on from the different trenches here and the water depth, you can see here, and here's from the Kermadec trench. The oxygen uptake rate is plotted against the estimated surface production, which is done from remote sensing here. And you can see that the variation we have within the Kermadec trench sort of more or less spans all these different trenches that was targeted in the Pacific before. And when we move to the Atacama trench, you get very high levels up here, but not necessarily linearly related just to the primary production. So there's an overall relation where increased primary production of the surface ocean is reflected in the activity you have in the Hadal system, but it's, that activity is also modulated by other factors. And just to sort of scale it, if you put a line here, it corresponds to about the activity in the Hadal trench on average is 1.4% of what you have in, uh, of the surface productivity. Um, if we look at the total organic carbon, here we have the abyssal plane where you sort of have the normal 
relatively low uh, level of uh, organic carbon here that exponentially decline with depth. You have the oxygen penetration depth here. When we move into the trench, you can see you have much higher carbon in some places very close to the surface and also in anoxic parts of the sediment. So the trenches are actually a site where we can have a lot of anaerobic degradation at great depth, which is normally not what we encounter in the deep sea. Um, and I won't, because I can see time is running, so I won't go too much into that, but we're developing instruments where we can sort of quantify the anaerobic degradation pathways by injecting labeled uh, electron acceptors or uh, labeled uh, organic substrates and follow the rate by transformations in situ to quantify that. We've done that for nitrogen and for sulfate. I'll just skip that, but here, for instance, you can see sulfate reduction rates at um, I should say that these are laboratory measurements because we don't want to inject radioactive stuff in the seabed directly, uh, and, and we're not allowed to handle it on deck. But you can see you have sulfate reduction rates even at hail water depth in these trench systems. So that brings me to the key messages, and, and that is that hail trenches are deep sea hotspots for deposition and mineralization of organic material. <coughs> hail trenches exhibit a very high temporal and spatial variability, which we have to acknowledge, and we need a lot of new instrument developments also to um, quantify the anaerobic degradation pathways in situ. So some of the questions that we are focusing on, is, on now is what are the sources and the nature and the pathway of the organic material that maintain this high biological activity in hail systems, and what are the pathways and the efficiency by which carbon is degraded at this extreme high pressure. To what extent are microbial communities along trench axis different to what extent are they similar in different trench systems because they are adapted to this high pressure? And for instance, non-spore forming anaerobic uh, communities, to what extent are they different in different trench systems around the Pacific Ocean? And to what extent are they similar to what we know from the coastal ocean? And what are the role of viruses, protozoa, and myofauna in shaping um, uh, hadal microbial communities and for the biogeochemical function? Well, that I and by thanking a lot of collaborators and students and technicians in this endeavor here, it's really, it's really a team effort here. It's just a team from the Atacama Trench, and uh, we are now preparing to go for the Japan Trench, uh, doing a similar effort. And of course, the funding aid is most importantly the European Research Council. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions for Ronnie. Well, well, Will Burleson, USA. I'm the only one who stands up each <laughs> A really interesting, fascinating. The trenches are subduction zones, and subduction is clearly uh, uh, inducing a pressure gradient within the sediments. The, the two plates are in conflict, and of course, that pressure can translate into uh, poor water advection processes. Can you... Um, Tell us about any examinations of uh, evidence of advection as a part of uh, driving some of these very high rates that you see and their asymmetry across a trench, just a small distance, might be reflecting some of these differences in pressure, uh, advection, flow. Yeah. In, the, in the sediment, as such, the sediment is impermeable as such, but you could have uh, channels where things are moving up. There has been one Camera, one photo taken from the Kermelec Trench at 8,000 meters of maybe something that could be interpreted like that. But these trenches have not been investigated, and it's likely that something like that occurs. I would say it's not very prominent. Now we have been in about five, six trenches, and we have done a lot of videoing, a lot of camera toes in them, and we haven't seen anything that looks like that. And if you look in, I didn't have time to show that, we have course made detailed characterization of the organic carbon. So if we do see imprint of chemosynthetic communities, for instance, associated to vents or sites like that, we have not seen that. That doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, there's many places to look still, so. Um, Colleen Durkin from the Moss Landing Marine Labs. And I, I was curious about kind of if you could speculate, um, if you collected a marine snow particle from below 1,000 meters and then put it in your pressure chambers, do you think you would see degradation by specialized bacteria communities from the deep ocean? Or do that, does it have to wait till it hits the seafloor? Yeah. Um, we have not done that. Of course, that's 
on the list as well. But other people have done that, um, especially Geo Hendel's group in, in Austria have done similar things from the mesopelagic, where they do see, but they, they hang around those partly, they're focusing on hang around in the water column for a very long time. And there you clearly have communities that are adapted to high pressure and also that have a lot of eukaryotes, fungi, which is very exciting as well, that helps degrading these particles. So that's a matter of how quickly does it sink and how quickly does it get colonized by microbes before reaching the seabed. This one there. I was curious about your hotspots and so um, and how temporally variable they were. And so, do you think that the um, changes in benthic fluxes for oxygen, for example, are seeing a lot of variations with sediment supply, or since there's so much organic matter coming into those spots that they aren't that variable, and just the fluxes depend on the amount of oxygen available instead of the organic matter? Sorry, I didn't get the last part. So do you think that the um, changes in oxygen profile, like the hot oxygen profiles in the hot spots, mm. are variable with depending on sediment supply, or do you think it's more dependent on just the amount of oxygen available because there's always enough organic matter there? No, it, it's certainly dependent on the on the type of particle. We have also looked at carcasses and other things that that's not nearly as labile as, for instance, phycodestrital material. So it's very dependent on to what extent the liability of that material is if you get an anoxic hotspot, as we've got here, which of course has implications for the nitrogen cycle and many other things. But these ones lasted in the order of 120 to 200 hours. But these ones, are, I know some that we produce, so we know what they're produced from, and we can do them similar. And then we add them to deep sea sediments that we have, and then we study them in the lab. So it's not something that's been done down there. But we can clearly see variations, of course, in the benthic response, depending on what type of particle. 